What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Board Game Design Lab. Today, today we're going to play some workers. We're going to talk about what it looks like to design a worker placement game. And we're talking to Shim Phillips and Sam McDonald from Garfield Games. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Hello. Yeah, really excited to have you guys here. You, you two have put together just some of the best worker placement games in the industry. Uh, over and over again, you, you come out with, with new mechanisms, new way of placing workers, new way, ways of scoring points. And, and so I'm just really uh, excited to kind of get y'all's perspectives on how to design these games, you know, how to come up with uh, new ideas, how to make things innovative, how to make things different and shiny and new and do well on Kickstarter and all that good stuff. But before we get into it, who are you? How'd you get into game design? All that kind of thing. Shim, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I've been uh, been doing this for about 12 or 13 years now, I think. Um, I actually got into designing games before I even knew anything about the modern board game hobby at all. Um, so uh would have been, I think I, I wanted to make a little like family roller move game um, way back in my early 20s. Um, so I went about designing that and... Um, made all the bits um like source bits from different places so the tiles from germany got the rule books made locally and we'll make these almost like kit set style um games which i could sell to my friends basically just making them for um as cheap as possible and selling them at, at cost price um and then after doing that first game um i then got introduced to a local board game convention started learning more about these new modern board games um, and was really on this kind of journey of learning what makes what, what how to make great games, but I was kind of learning it as I was still trying to produce these games. Um, so I always sort of refer to it as I was learning on the job quite a bit. So I've learned a lot and my, my games have changed a lot over those years. Gotcha. And Sam, what brought you into the industry? Well, it was kind of a bit of a happy accident, really. Uh, I always loved playing games, but I wasn't much of a collector up until maybe three or four years ago. Shem uh, was a bandmate, so I played drums and Shem played guitar in a band that we were in. So we knew that we could sort of work together creatively. Uh, I used to test a lot of Shem's games. He, he introduced me to Pandemic and Citadels. And, you know, one day when I was at work on my lunch break, this idea for a game came to me. I scribbled a few ideas down on pieces of paper. I got home to my flat that night. I drew it up on a whiteboard, cut out some pieces of paper and I raided all my other games like Cosmic Encounter for pieces. Ooh. And yeah, Shem doesn't love Cosmic Encounter, but anyway, we'll continue. Uh, <laughs> and then I decided I'd contact Shem just to see what he thought of this game. You know, just because he, he knows a lot about games, he produces them. And I just wanted advice from a friend, you know, could this be something? And about after two or three plays with him, Shem was like, yep, let's do this together. And that ended up being Architects of the West Kingdom. So, yeah, I haven't really looked back from there. Yeah, well, I'd say that game, uh, it did pretty well. I think that was uh, a pretty, <laughs> <Yeah>. good, <laughs> pretty good choice there. Now, Shim, tell me about the development of Garfield Games as a, as a company. Where, you know, when did that happen? How did the idea come along? What made you want to get into the publishing side of things? Well, back then, um, for me to actually get a game published being based in New Zealand would have been extremely hard. Um, it would have involved going to conventions overseas, which for me was a lot of money at the time. Still is a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, so it never really dawned on me to even attempt that. Um, the first people I know of that actually achieved it uh, well were um, Jarrett and Carl, who got Endeavor picked up by Z-Man. Um, but I don't believe that was done in person, though. So it's quite rare for a New Zealander back then. Um, so my solution was just to make the game myself. Um, so I never really set out to be a publisher, I suppose. I just wanted to make a game. And then after doing that game, I thought, hey, can I do another one? You know, is, is this my one game or can I make more? So I just kept, for, I guess for five or six years, just keep going, can I make another one? And for me, I, I enjoy production. I enjoy creating the entire the entire thing, the, the visuals and everything. So I just kept making games how I knew how to do it. Um, and then when, when Kickstarter came to New Zealand, that's when it kind of changed a lot for me. Yeah, for sure. Now, what have been some of the bigger uh, obstacles in New Zealand? Obviously, you know, shipping out of New Zealand to other parts of the world is super expensive. But what else have you run into as far as, you know, being kind of on an island isolated? Yeah, so, I mean, back then, I didn't know anyone else locally. That was probably the biggest part of it. Um, until I put games up on Kickstarter, um, I didn't really have much of a network in New Zealand as far as designers go. Um, so I felt quite isolated as a designer. Um 
and until until I started networking with more people in New Zealand, we now have like a, a Facebook group of a couple hundred people that are involved, um, like a little design group. We meet up every six or eight weeks locally with people to test games. But before before that happened, it was very isolating. Um, I found channels like the Maple Syrup Show in Canada. So I tuned into these like YouTube live streams to kind of, in a way, get that community feel from other designers. Um, and I, I really believe and honestly would say that until I did meet other designers, my games weren't as good because um, I wasn't getting that really good feedback from people. So it's probably the biggest challenge. Gotcha. All right, well, let's jump into the topic for this episode, talking about worker placement. So let's get a good working definition. Sam, why don't you go first? Kind of, what are, what are your thoughts? So if somebody says worker placement, what does that mean? What do you think that is just personally? Yeah, so there's kind of the, the broad definition is if anyone's placing workers to take actions, that's kind of the broad running definition. Some other people like to specify a little bit more. They would say that you're drafting actions with these workers. So that would mean that your workers block other people um, from taking those actions. But I think it's probably better if we just say that we are selecting actions with workers that are available to us. Yeah, and typically these workers are pawns or meeples or, or dice. Cubes. Yeah, yeah, it could be dice. I guess people might want to, you know, say, "Oh, that's dice placement." I guess, but I guess dice placement is just a subset, subcategory of worker placement. Uh, Shim, do you have any kind of differing definition, or is that what you feel as well? Yeah, I think it's. I agree with Sam completely. Um, but it's also just it's like a general feel as well. I think that worker placements have they are very um, in, like ex- usually quite accessible euro game. Um, obviously you've got to have the mechanisms to support that it's a worker placement, but, um, they, yeah, I think worker placement as a genre has a very similar feel to it. So Raiders, Raiders North Sea is kind of worker placement game because of how it feels to play it more than strictly how, what you're doing on your turn or that kind of thing. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's like a rough thing. eh? like, it's like we kind of categorize movies into like comedy and drama, but there's always these mishmash and blending that happens. Yeah, and at the end of the day, the definitions are there to help us. You know what yeah. I mean? They're, they're, they're words that we use to help us to kind of narrow things down so that we can understand kind of what we're getting into. You mean they're not reasons for us to argue and hate each other on the internet? I thought that was the whole point. Of, of these. That's, no. the main reason. that's the main reason. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> All right. So why do you think these games are so popular? Shim, you mentioned just a moment ago that, that people you know, are just kind of drawn to these games as Euro games are very accessible. They do very well on Kickstarter. You know, a lot of the top 100 and 200 on Board Game Geek rank wise are worker placement games. Uh, Sam, why do you think these games do so well? One of the reasons I think is they just often look quite pretty. You've got a really big board with all these different locations that they'll make the locations look and feel different um, and they'll feel thematic. Another reason I would say, Shem kind of hit on it with the the complexity. It kind of sits in that, often will sit in that mid-weight euro. So you can pick it up, but there's enough depth there. And then a final thing that I'd add is that there's just the right amount of interaction. So there's blocking and you kind of, you really are interacting with the players and watching what they're doing but they never do anything that feels really, really bad. You know, there's not really take that um, inherently involved in worker placement, just minor blocking. Gotcha. And then Shim, from the publishing side of things, I mean, you, you keep putting these games out. So obviously they're doing well, you know, if they weren't making you any money, you'd, you'd publish something else. And so tell me from the publishing side of things, you know, what you've seen as, as far as the marketplace being drawn to these games and why do you think that is? I would I'd argue that, like, say 20 or 30 years ago, that dice rolling was, like, the thing in games. So if you played a game with a family and you passed the person the dice, they know to roll those dice on their turn. It's just, like, the thing you do on your turn. I think it has that same simplicity of worker placement where it's, like, I've got my worker, it's my turn, I put my worker down. It's just so simple to grasp, which I think is why it's it's a great a great tool to use um, for those, those, yeah, those medium-weight games. From a publishing point of view... Um, it's quite funny. I never actually set out to make worker placement games. I'm not like trying to reinvent anything or, or do that. It's just when we go to create some of these games, it feels like the most natural mechanism to use often. Gotcha. And so Sam, why design one of these? What, what made you want to create one of these, you know, create multiple of these at this point, what kind of drew you in as far as a design standpoint? 
uh, in a sense, I didn't have much control over it. It's just the idea that came to me, you know. Uh, I had I had kind of two ideas about a, a game, which was which ended up being Architects. The first one was, hey, what if we had a worker placement game where we could capture other people's workers? And I thought that could be quite fun. Could you round them up and send them to prison? Instead of workers blocking actions, they um, they can be taken away. And then I thought, Oh, that could work really well if you had a what I call a worker investment mechanism. So you're only placing one worker on your turn, but the more workers that you have on a spot, the more rewards you get. And so those two mechanisms actually work really, really nicely together because as players get more and more workers on a spot, they get more resources, and then other players want to prevent them from getting that big um, haul of resources. So they come in and they capture them. And, and so it's quite dynamic. And that was kind of the uh, the idea behind Architects. Gotcha. And then, Shim, what kind of drew you in? Like you said, you, you weren't necessarily setting out to design a bunch of worker placement games. So what is it about this mechanism that really kind of gets you excited and you keep designing more games? I think the first one I played would have been Stone Age, um, which really captivated me back then, just going back quite a few years. I actually designed a... It was a challenge for a design competition to put this little game in a tin, almost like the Midworks kind of ones now. Um, but I designed this little card-based and dice placement style game. Um, and that was my first first attempt at it, and I quite enjoyed making that game. It was a very small print run. Um, and then I think I'd already designed Shipwrights, which was my first Viking game at that point. Um, but when that came out, people were saying, hey, let's, let's do some raiding in this, in this kind of series. So I set out to make raiders. Um, I had never really done a proper worker placement, I guess. Um, Tanzania was that kind of dice rolling style one um, so it was I guess for that one it, particularly I was trying to make a work placement although I spent a lot of time in the early development or design phase um, attempting to make the game feel like you were raiding um, that was the main goal so I always knew you want to have some crew in front of you um, and I think I had a few versions where it was just dice chucking I had some that was very stone age style worker placement and about like the seventh or eighth iteration, I kind of stumbled on this idea of placing a worker and picking up a worker. Um, and when I had that kind of, oh, there's something unique, there's something I can work with, that's when I started running with it. So I don't, I think it's, you just keep playing with the ideas until something fresh kind of sparks and you don't know what that's going to be. So it's not like you really, oh, I'm going to go out there and make a real fresh worker placement game. You just kind of go out there and try things until something really jumps at you and then you run with that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I've heard a lot of designers talk about letting the game be what it wants to be. And as yeah, you yeah. play it and play test it and design it and, and kind of let it do its own thing. And you obviously you're the designer, so you have control over it. But if it wants to be a worker placement game, then then let it let it run free. Let it run wild, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, all right, let, let's talk about some of y'all's favorites. I want to obviously talk about your games, the ones that you've designed and have done really, really well. But before we get into that, what are some of the, the favorites uh, that stick out to you? Like, what are some of the games that have inspired you or kind of helped you become better at designing worker placement games? Sam, what are, what are some of your favorites? Ah, that's a really, really good question. I quite like Keyflower and Asara. They both do some interesting things with, with colored workers and how that affects other players and what they can do in their turns. Underwater Cities also, I've been playing that recently with Shem, and that is an amazing design, and it makes me... Um, it inspires me, I guess, with some new mechanism ideas as well. Very cool. Now, what is it about those games? You mentioned the colors. What else kind of gets you excited? Like, what, what are some of the things that listeners can, can take away? Like, why should listeners of this, if they want to be good at designing these games, why should they play those games? So if we if we take a game like Keyflower, where the first uh, worker that you place on an action spot determines the color that all other workers uh, all other players must use to take that action that's just so crunchy and you're hiding these workers behind your uh, screen so players can't see necessarily what colors you have stacked up uh, so there's a lot of mind games going on there and i love that that mechanism there gotcha and then jim what are some of your favorites um so early on i you know stone age and Water Deep was some of the ones I played. I think Pillars of the Earth was the first one that really grabbed me quite a bit, um, simply because it had kind of two levels of worker placement. You had your your little dudes, which act almost like a resource, really, to kind of claim um, cards at the start, and then you use your um, big 
builder workers to actually take the actions. And I liked how, how it was resolved, how you kind of bid for early placement. Um, and then more recently, well, not too recent, but Village was one that stood out to me as almost a worker removal style game. Uh, yeah, more recently, it's Underwater Cities, Genties. Um, yeah, quite a few. I really like Lewis and Clark as well. That's got a good mix of worker placement and um, that kind of card play deck building style stuff as well. So really a lot of influences. I just enjoy stuff when it's kind of fresh and someone's done something new with it. Yeah, very cool. Now, Pillars of the Earth, that was one where you would place a whole bunch of workers at one time, right? That one, yeah, that's that's like the um, kind of the resource spending for cards at the start of the round. Um, so those were your little workers you did. You could either spend money, I think, at that point for some cards or you could place your workers, which, yeah, were multiple ones, like four for this card, five for that. And then once everyone's done that, you would then go around, you draw out of the bag a, I think they're called master work, master builders or something, and you'd get placed on this kind of, uh, this, res- uh, this gold track. So if you get your one drawn out of the bag first, um, it's like five coins or something to place, place that on the board for the action that you want, or you can pass. And then they'll go around this kind of track of maybe, I think it's seven or eight spots, and the money gets lower and lower and lower. And once everyone's done that, you wrap around and then place them for free after that. So you can spend money to place um, ahead of time. And then they resolve the entire board in a cycle. In a cycle. So that was quite cool, quite unique. Yeah, definitely. And then you mentioned Village. That's one of my favorites. I love that one because your workers have a limited amount of time that you can use them and you're actually you know, spending their lives, so to speak. And then eventually they're going to die and they get to go on these kind of places on the board where they get to be remembered by the local community and you gain, gain points and things like that. It's cool how you, you want to use your workers, but you also want to remove them from the game because you score other, other points and things like that. Uh, you mentioned Stone Age. What is it about that one? That uh, Why should people play it? I think that was just a classic. So that's like one of the first ones. Um, it's just a very easy to learn, solid, um, clean design. There's not much going on, but it's just what it does, it does well. Um, and that's, yeah, I think it's, if you've never played a worker placement, that's a great one to start with because it'll kind of teach you the, the very simple basics of how the mechanism works. All right, let's talk about y'all's games. Uh, so you've designed quite a few uh, and you've kind of got two different uh, tracks or, or different universes, or are they maybe even in the same universe? I'm not sure, but you have the Western Kingdoms and you have the North Sea lines of games. And so, Shim, real quick, tell me why you chose to kind of have these two different tracks. Are they all in the same world? So we might see some kind of intermingling of things, what, you know, Raiders of the West Kingdom or something like that <laughs> uh, one day down the road. Like, tell me, tell me more. So they are, they are the same world. Um, the, in Paladins, which is the second game in the West Kingdom, that brings in, it kind of ties them together. You start seeing the Vikings coming to attack and that kind of stuff. Um, so they're definitely the same. I just, I changed the box colors to make the trilogies kind of stand apart. So you know that the West Kingdom is all red boxes, the North is all blue. Um, that's the only reason. And also because having that many games in a series can get confusing, even just one trilogy. Um, but that started out with the kickst- my first Kickstarter um, I had this game on my shelf for like two years that I designed that I knew I couldn't produce by my usual methods of kind of, in a way, homemade games. Um, so when Kickstarter came to New Zealand, I thought, hey, it's a great chance to um, to make this game I finally want to make. It needs a lot of art. It needs a big, bigger box than I'm used to. Um, so I set out to do that. I honestly went into it thinking I might make 500 and maybe sell half of them lucky. And that might be my last game. Cause it's, it's been a fun, fun journey, but I might just stop here. Um, and then I was just overwhelmed by the attention that I got on Kickstarter. I had no idea at that point that people go there to buy games. I thought it was just a crowdfunding site. Um, so yeah, that I ended up printing, I think it was 1600 copies or something like that in China. Um, lost a lot of money as you do when you first do your Kickstarter. Um, but then after that, um, people were saying on the comments and on emails saying that they enjoyed they enjoyed the look of the game, the game itself. They liked the idea of building your ships in the, in the North Sea, but why can't we use these ships to go and raid? Um, and that kind of sparked for me, hey, maybe I should do a second game in this series. Um, so that year I worked on Raiders. And then in my mind, it just makes more sense to do a trilogy rather than just two games that don't they connect but don't really have any kind of finality or kind of roundness to them um so i just thought well let's make three games and for me in my mind it made sense to do explorers because you've built your ships you've gone raiding now you're going out further abroad um 
And when I got to the end of that one, um, from a marketing point of view, it made a lot of sense to continue with um, the same art style and everything. Um, and I, because that was the North Sea, I thought, well, I could do a South or an East or a West. Um, and at that point, I was considering like maybe a South Pacific. Um, so actually changing the time period completely, maybe changing the art style. I just had a lot of things in my mind to think about. And I had a few ideas working away, but that was when Sam basically showed me his um, early prototype for architects. Um, and I was like, this is actually, this is pretty good. This is quite a unique mechanism. I can't think I've ever seen that kind of work investment before. Um, and it just made sense. Sam at that point had set it in like a citadel, was kind of fantasy medieval setting. And it just made sense, like this should be the West Kingdom. This should be a French game about building buildings because the French are known for their fancy architecture. Um, and that's just kind of where it went. So we've got plans for like the South and the East um, as well. So we'll, we'll see where that happens. Anyway, sorry, Sam. I was just going to say how original it was that there was a game set in France about building a, th- a cathedral. That's, that's totally original. <laughs> no one Never been done before. Never. <laughs> but it Breaking works. And it works. <laughs> yeah, totally. We actually toyed with that a lot. We're like, it's not unique enough. We need to change it somehow. Like we're trying to do squires, like you're training knights. But then in the end, we just said, this makes sense. Like it's not very unique and not very original, but it's just building, building seems to make sense. So sometimes you, you can try and fight it as much as you like, but it just want, like you're saying before, the game wants to be what it is. Yeah. And I guess the biggest thing is make a really good game. And, you know, if the theme just kind of goes along with it and that's just going to enhance it and just let it be what it wants, you know, and I love how the games have kind of, they've taken on this emergent story, right? And so we, we go from here and then we go to there and then we're going to do this. We're going to explore. We're going to raid. It's very, very cool from a, a just publishing standpoint. You kind of step back and, and you can look at the trajectory of your narrative, so to speak, yeah, yeah. just with your different games. It's, it's really cool. All right. So let's talk about these uh, your games more individually, just kind of the design process, the challenges you ran into. The main three I want to talk about are raiders, paladins, and architects. And so, Sam, let's let's start off with you. You hadn't, you hadn't talked in a while, and so let's let's get like tell me your design process. Kind of, you already told a little bit about you had this idea for worker investment, but give me more. Give me more behind the scenes about Architects of the West Kingdom and how it came to be, and then we'll talk, you know, of challenges and, and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So I'm very much a mechanism kind of guy. So if there's a really good mechanical hook that is fun, that makes you want to come back and play it, I'm stoked. And so that's really what I want to work on to start with. So I've explained the worker investment mechanism, but that's just a mechanism. What was the the game going to be uh, surrounding it? And Shem has mentioned that it was kind of building buildings in in the medieval times. So the workers gathering resources was the thing that made sense. And so we needed to have a fair amount of resources uh, so that you have this tension about where you want to put your workers. Do you want to just invest in one spot and get all the wood in the world, cut down all the forests, but then you don't have any stone, then you don't have any clay. And so, yeah, there, there's a tension between sp- spreading out your workers and going hard on one spot and hit, getting more benefit from that one spot. Then we started to um, add in other ideas about could we have this kind of good versus evil theme running through it, this kind of corruption versus virtue kind of thing. And that's where we added in the, the virtue track and then there's the black market and the cathedral. And so how the virtue track works is throughout the game, the decisions that you make, you might be doing good things like giving resources to the king at the king's storehouse, or you might be working on the cathedral. If you make those good decisions, you're going to be moving up the virtue track. If you make more kind of uh, dodgy decisions, if you're playing a little bit more evil, then you're going to be dropping down the virtue track. So things like robbing the tax stand, things like uh, going to the black market. And the game is going to be played differently for you based on those decisions that you've made. So if you've made too many evil decisions, now you are locked out of the cathedral. They won't accept you there anymore. They just won't let you work on the church. And if you're too much of a goody two-shoes, you're not allowed into the black market because they think that you might snitch on them. So uh, this allows for so many different ways of playing. People really do feel like they're being a bit more evil. People do feel like they're being the police if they're rounding up everyone else's workers. Or some people love sitting at the top of the virtue track and just being a goody two-shoes always getting their workers out of prison so that was the one of the things and then the final thing we wanted to add was engine building i guess there was 
a little bit of innate engine building and where your workers are invested. But once they're captured, you've kind of lost all that progress. So that's where we added in the apprentices. And these allow for uh, more kind of divergent strategies. Um, and in some play groups, they'll be watching that workshop. There's a kind of a, an area of eight cards. And when one of their favorite cards comes into the workshop, they all go, ooh, ah, and they want to rush to grab that, that apprentice before the others. So yeah. That's part of the process, I'd say. Yeah, the biggest challenge, I think, for that one, for me, because I did a lot of the, the number crunching behind it all, like, say with, with Raiders, it was quite simple because um, we know that at the end of a game, a piece of gold in your supply is worth a point. So you've got this, like, kind of um, plumb line, I guess, of what things are worth. So I know that if I give up, you think there's an action where you can discard two cards to get a gold. But, oh, that means that a card is half a point. So you can kind of math it out as I think a lot of designers would understand that you do this a lot for Euro style games with architects. It was a real challenge for me because you place a worker, which has some kind of value to placing workers, like a, the value of a turn, I guess um, you place a worker at the stone at the quarry, you get a stone, your second worker, you get two stone then three stone. So I had this, like, how the heck can I balance this game? This is bizarre. I have to, I have to figure out what is the value of a turn. Um, and that, that was the big challenge. So I had to run this like um, this, 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 my spreadsheet kind of like, well, you might get to about three or four on a spot before someone captures you. So I had to like get a kind of average of what you're getting on your turn at this spot. So I had to, I had to figure out what is stone worth, what is wood worth. And then this additional challenge um, on top of that, there were things like the virtue track as well. But the other challenge was like the, the thing about how Sam's talking about when you spam one location, you get lots of wood or lots of stone. There has to be some kind of reward or extra cost involved in going to different locations. So some cards might require two resources, um, which is quite easy to get, whereas one might require five different resources, which spends a lot of different time investing in different spots. We had to calculate like what is the value of having different resources and cards. So that was a, that was a big challenge um, from a, a number crunching side of things for me in Architects. Yeah. Now, do you normally just use spreadsheets for all your games when you're trying to balance things? Yeah, to, to an extent. I think we often start just by feel, um, and then we will really, once we know the game's working, we'll then spend some time like crunching the numbers and then playing it a lot more again and then still go by feel at the end of the day. Gotcha. And so when do you really try to balance it? I, I've talked to some designers that, that right from the beginning, they're trying to crunch the numbers and make it balance early on some way to the middle, some way to the end until, you know, blind play testing, basically to worry about balance. <laughs> when do you do it? I'd say in the middle. Um, so like I think Viscounts, which is our latest one that was on Kickstarter recently, that has three very different kind of strategic paths you can take and they, you blend them together to form your strategy in the game. Um, but that was like, there were so many variables in the game that it was hard to balance. Um, so we did a lot of just play it, play it, play it. Oh, nobles feel strong. Let's tweak them down a bit. Oh, buildings feel weak. Let's bring them up. A lot of that. And then I think once we felt like it was balanced, we actually dove right in and did the math and figured out, is it actually balanced? And then with that in mind, went back into it, played it more, tweaked it some more. And just, yeah, we that was much more, um, what's the word, kind of organic for us, I guess. Whereas a game like Raiders, which is very, very simple and contained in its mechanisms, is so easy to balance just on the on the spreadsheet. Yeah, and there's another issue as well with games like, not Paladins, but with games like Architects and Viscounts, where they've got a variable length of time. So the game will end faster depending on how people are playing. How, that's really hard to balance. You know, so if everyone in Architects, for example, is building the cathedral, it's going to be a really, really fast game. And so the players that play the evil strategy are often not going to do well, depending on how the others are playing, if they're playing it quickly. But if you play a really long game of people are hoarding their resources and building bigger buildings, then the evil player does a lot, lot better. So, yeah, I, I, I like the variable end, um, the variable end, like, timer, but it does add a few headaches for sure. Yeah, and for those who haven't played that game, I think a good um, example is like Azul. So in Azul, the game triggers when someone finishes a row, I think. So uh, it's funny, you see comments online saying, oh, I got my, I got 110 points. Like, well, that's very relative to the entire game. So like everyone probably scored higher in that game, whereas you could win with like 45 points if everyone, if the game was really short. So 
it makes scores quite strange because you can't really say, oh, that's the best score ever because it was variable. Whereas in Paladins, which is set to a number of rounds, then the scores are like very definitive. Yeah, it could also make your playtesting kind of interesting because if you have players scoring 40 points in one game and 110 in the next one, it might make yeah. you think, wow, my game must be broken, but maybe not. Maybe it's just yeah. you know, the way the end game uh, is structured. I say for architects, we had to we had to like check the like how much they won by. It was all relative to other players. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Now, Shim, tell me about the design process for Raiders of the North Sea. Tell me about kind of how you came up with the the idea for the the worker placement and displacement mechanism. I don't know if you have a, a better. I, I call it the up and down system. You know, I, I put one down, <laughs> I pick one up uh, every time. And so, tell me about that game. Yeah, I think I like I like the term place and pick. I think it's quite a good one. Um, yeah, so that one was definitely from a, I started with the setting first. The kind of overall story was that we wanted to go raiding. So the name was already set before I started designing it, basically. Um, so that went through, I think it was about eight different game versions. Uh, one of them was like very heavy on your collecting resources, um, like almost like for set collecting in the village itself, which is more like like Stone Age or Lords of Waterdeep. Um, and I think some of the playtesting comments I got um, well, this is winding forward a bit, but we're like, oh, I feel like I just want to go out and grab tons of stuff when I raid. Like, I want to go out there and pick up all the stuff off the board and chuck it in front of me. So it was that was kind of inspired by more the feel, um, the mechanism. Um, so the I mean the the place one pick one mechanism was very much like just a spark of an idea that worked. Um, so it wasn't like I was spending tons of time thinking about it. Just like that that could work. But then adding the layers of the different colored workers that can be, you kind of add a bit of progression to the game um, were, were the, was one of the other things. But the biggest challenge for me in that game was actually, does this feel like raiding? And some people would probably say, no, it doesn't. That's fine because it's a Euro game. But like for me, it, it kind of ticks the boxes as far as how I feel about the game. So it's, yeah, you, you spend only a bit of time in the village, mainly kind of getting money, getting provisions, getting your crew, and then it's all about going out and grabbing stuff off the board. That's the kind of feel you want um, in the game. And the last challenge, I think, in the game for me was the the Valkyrie mechanism. So in the game, there are little uh, tokens on the plunder spots. That if you take them, your crew will die. So number of crew will die, one for each. Um, and I think I, it's hard to remember, but I think I had it in the game quite early on, but there was no other purpose to it. It was just like, you died. <laughs> That's it. Um, so I think in the very late in the play testing, like even after like a bit of public testing, I started thinking about, Hey, maybe you can get points for this. Like the, just a, a natural ramp of the more you do, the more you get kind of thing. And I think I tried one or two different ideas and landed on the one that was like just a simple track, just that you move up and you get more points, the higher you go. And I think that in the game really helps to reinforce the theme as well of kind of this glory and battle and death and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess for me, as a designer, the biggest challenge for that game was actually coming at it from more of a theme point of view rather than just a mechanisms point of view because I was always about mechanisms leading up to that. I'd always start with, hey, how can I use this dice differently? How can I use cards differently? Whereas with that game, it was my first attempt to go, all right, the name is Raiders. We're going to be raiding. What are the mechanisms? Yeah, definitely. I want to talk more about theme in just a minute. Let's uh, break down... Your other game, uh, Paladins of the West Kingdom, this is a, a co-design for both of you. And so, Sam, tell me about that one. Tell me kind of your process there, and then, Shim, I'll get your thoughts. Yeah, so again, we kind of knew uh, sort of vaguely what the theme was going to be. We knew that it was going to be the West Kingdom. Hey, look, we've built the city. Now let's defend it, you know? And this was going to be a great way of tying in potentially the other trilogies. Shem said to me early on in the piece that, hey, Raiders was probably the heaviest game in the North Sea, game two. So how about we make game two a little bit heavier? And Architects probably, arguably, is heavier than uh, Raiders. So we knew that we were going to go quite heavy. <laughs> so that was the, all the license that we needed. Uh, we were playing around with lots and lots of different ideas. But this one that sticked was uh, an idea of having different colored workers not for each player but everyone gets the different colored workers and they're using these workers on their player board to take actions um i found out later that orleon kind of had already done that but um <laughs> so we did a little bit of tweaking just to make sure it didn't feel exactly the same and it doesn't feel exactly the same we've got a draft of workers at the start of each round and then uh, there are there are multiple ideas but one of them was that these outsiders are coming into the city 
And so you can either attack them or you can convert them. And we just, we love multi-use cards. So you get an immediate benefit if you attack them and you'll get an, uh, a long-term end game benefit if you convert them. And, and what also that does is it adds interaction. So let's say that there's a card that would really, really benefit Shem if he converts it. I don't have the faith to be able to convert that person, but I could still attack it and, and make sure that Shem can't get that card. He would do that too. That's pretty much Sam, right? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Now this is the second game that we've talked about. So Raiders and Paladins both have you know different colored uh, workers that allow you to do different things. So Shim, tell me about that. Like, why is that an interesting mechanism? Why is that an interesting way to do it? You know, tell me about the the different colors and what they mean in different games. All that. I just like that in games. I like when the the kind of the the placement mechanism of a worker placement game is like a shared resource. Um, so. Raiders was my first attempt at that. You don't really own the workers, the, you share them. Um, it just makes quite a unique feel in a game, I guess, rather than just like, I've got my three guys and I can get two more later on if I try hard. Um, so it just changes it up. Um, for us, the there was there is a bit of theme behind them. They've got like the reds are like your knights, your fighters, the greens are your scouts, that kind of stuff, um, which helped us inform our decisions about what the actions are. So to go... Uh, commission a monk you need like a scout and a cleric uh, whereas to go and attack you'd need a um i think it's a merchant and a, a merchant trader where they are and like a fighter um, so we, we we kind of we create this triangle thing in the game which is the whole story in a way but where um we had to kind of assign workers and resources to the different actions in the game um, but the 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 colored workers really just they create like a an interesting decision space, I guess, is what they do. If they're all just the same color and they didn't matter, then the decisions would be quite boring in the game. You just go, well, I've got three dudes. I put the three dudes on the three spot, or oh, this spot or that spot. Whereas now you've got two reds, a blue and a green. You want to do two actions that require green, but you've only got one green. So which one do you do? And what do you do the blue guys for? So that creates those interesting decisions, which is really the crux of what makes Paladins quite a crunchy game, is that, it's a really hard puzzle to figure out because there's always multiple things you want to do, but you can't do everything, but you might if you do something else. So it kind of has that, that fun puzzle to it. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things going back to the, to why people are drawn to these games is that you have actions that I guess you have, you have more, more to do than you have time to do. Right. And, and there's always cool things going on. There's always cool choices. And even if you get blocked, you know, even if you're playing a game where, you know, if you put your guy in that space, I really want to go to and I can't go there anymore. But there's still two or three other options where I can still keep going. So I don't necessarily feel like uh, it doesn't feel like a take that mechanism necessarily. It, it still feels like, OK, you block me there, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to change my strategy a little bit. I'm going to get these resources this turn. I'll do that other thing next turn. And I feel like it's just a cool way to do it. And so when you have a game like like y'all's where you have different colors, you have different things to think about. It's like, okay, here's some really cool choices and I'm kind of puzzling out how I'm going to do it. And, oh, you're doing that over there. Okay, in that case, I'll do this over here. And it's just a really cool decision space uh, for these games. Sam, would you say that, that that's accurate? Would you say that that is one of the things that draws people in? Is that something you like about these games? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another thing that we, we like to add is yeah that kind of multiple paths to victory you know uh, we you go into paladin saying maybe i'll try something different this time maybe i'll go down the attack convert sort of path or maybe i'll just go all out commissioning and and the game allows you to do that and you can get points from multiple different areas and i guess you would call it a point salad but people like point salad for that reason that they've got a lot of agency a lot of choice uh, with what they can do yeah now when it comes to a point salad game you know, Shim, a lot of times people get upset because they can't really figure out what they need to do. It's like, well, everything scores points. And then, you know, they get to the end of the game and they lose. And they're like, well, I don't really know why I lost. I did all these things and gained points. You, you did other things and you gained more points. I don't know how that happened. And so how do you, you know, make sure there's lots of paths to victory, lots of different things people can do. But at the same time, players feel like they can create a strategy that they can say, okay, I won or lost based on these things I was doing versus just, I don't, I don't even know where to, where to look. I've definitely been in that position where I've played a game and just at the end gone, why did I lose by like 40 points? Like, you know, I kind of, as a, even as a designer myself, I can't figure out why. That's really frustrating. And I can understand that people, if they don't know their game well enough, they will feel that frustration. So I totally get that. Um, and I think as designers, we need to be aware of that. Um, so for Paladins, um, that was an issue for us that we had to try and overcome. We had, it was all working, that the puzzle was working really well, but we had, 
there was no in a way diversity between players there was no like oh i want to go this strategy it was you want to go this one um the first thing we tried was like hidden agenda cards or hidden goal cards um but that actually made the puzzle worse because you were then there's an optimum thing you should be doing on your turn but that you should always do this um, which actually ruined the game it made it solvable um so we added in there's two things i said two things to to changed it up one thing was that we brought out these public goal cards so in the first round one gets revealed which might be let's say absolve so if you absolve five oh is it five times in that in that game the total game you'll get an extra four points so that gave new players especially something to aim towards um and then the second and third rounds other goals come out you don't have to go for all of them it's quite hard to achieve all of them um but it gave players some kind of direction it's, they're not forced down that path but they could go down that path and then the other thing that we brought in was along with those cards in the later rounds came out these um king's favor cards which become like public worker placement spots um so that was like we we're trying to add in tension we we're trying to add in direction and add in a little bit more interaction we kind of solved all those things by adding this like kind of shared line of cards that get revealed throughout the game and that seemed to for us at least seemed to fix a lot of the things we had that weren't quite working with the game. Yeah, very cool. All right, let's uh, let's go back to theme. Just a minute ago, Shim, you mentioned you know trying to add more theme in the games that really trying to bring the Viking theme to life. Uh, Sam, what are your ideals on theme? Because a lot of times Euro games they they get kind of put into the the genre as oh it's just another soulless Euro. It's just <laughs> another you know themeless. They just paste it on trading in the Mediterranean. This is really a mechanism with some art, and that's it. So how do you avoid that? How do you really bring a theme to life? Yeah, I like to make players feel like they are taking on a certain role, and that can be within the game and that can be within the group, like just at the table. So in architects, there's the capturing mechanism and it, the, the theme kind of almost comes out of the game and it kind of becomes this thing between the players. And, and so someone takes on the role of being the police, but I think it's, it's almost comedic in architects. And I think that really suits the, the um the art style as well because you've got these characters with these big long noses and bald heads and massive ears and you know everything is kind of disproportionate and and that's kind of yeah it is comedic as i said and and players can do that in the game so they really feel like they are being the policeman or they really feel like they're being the goody two shoes um and then you can add that to the medieval setting which i think it just sort of feels right um yeah, so that's kind of my theme contribution is how are players feeling? Can they take on different roles? Not necessarily do they feel like a builder, but do they feel like they're a part of this world that they're in now? Gotcha. And then, Shim, do you have any other thoughts on bringing a theme to life? Oh, man, I get so many comments on this. So it's, it's funny. I, the amount of times that I get a comment that says no theme and that's it. Like, that's the only comment they'll post about the whole game. Um, <laughs> well, just, thank you for the criticism. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, appreciate, yeah, appreciate the um, feedback. Yeah. So I think it's important. Well, I, I've kind of discovered over time that for me, I like to separate it a bit. So I like you have the setting, right? And then you have your, mechan your me uh, mechanisms. Then you have your theme. Um, so I, I'm quite heavy on, I guess, setting with an underlying story, which I think for a lot of people doesn't actually equate to theme. Um, because theme, when they talk about theme often, they're talking about immersion. So like, are you feeling like you're actually in the world doing this stuff? Whereas for me, I, it's I guess just a personal preference. I don't need that in a game, I suppose. Um, whereas I like to have an underlying story, a setting. A good example, I guess, I, I talked with my brother uh, two days ago about Star Wars, right? He did not like the latest Star Wars movie at all. He, he said the story was so weak, it was horrible. Whereas I was like, I love that world. I love being in that world, just the imagery, the characters. I don't need a really strong like, connecting story. And I think it's just a difference of people. Um, so I think an important thing to remember as a designer, you need to design games that you want to play, um, but also know that you can't please everyone. Um, I heard a really good podcast that you did. Um, we, we had a, a road trip up north a few uh, months back. And one of the, I can't remember what it was, but you had someone on talking about, there's like four aspects of a player. It was like um, play and the tactile stuff and other things. That was a really good episode um, talking about how different players need different things from games. Um, and it's important to try and meet those if you can, but you can't always meet all four. So, yeah, I think 
if you're going to make Euro games like we kind of do, just know that people who love chucking dice and, you know, playing the villain or, or whatever, they they might, they probably never going to like your game <laughs> at all. So you just have to accept that and make games that you love to make. Um, but I think you still need to serve them as much as you can. So there is a lot of theme put behind the games, but that is often more story, uh, more, sorry, more setting and more kind of purpose and reason for mechanisms, uh, less than it is like a kind of immersion into the theme itself. Yeah, definitely. And that episode is four types of gamer experiences with Ian Zhang. And great so, episode. yeah, that, it's such a great episode if you're trying to get into your, your players' heads, so to speak, and really trying to understand how people work, why they are drawn to different games, different uh, things happening in games. That's a really good uh, episode as far as like player psychology. And so yeah. I definitely recommend uh, people checking that one out. All right, let's switch gears. Let's talk a little bit about uh, victory points. So, I mean, the vast majority of, of uh, worker placement games uh, require victory points. They re- that's how you win. That's what you're trying to do during the game. You're trying to do different things in order to gain victory points so you can beat everybody else. And so how do you figure out victory points? How do you figure out how much things are worth? How do you figure out the kind of the, the scales of different things? You know, if, if I have one of this, it's worth one point. If I get two, it's worth three. You know, uh, how do you how do you figure those things out? So, Sam, what, what's kind of your process for for determining how much things are worth, how people win, that kind of thing? Yeah, I um I just start by obsessing over it and thinking about it in my head like crazy. And then later on, Shem will go to the spreadsheet. But I, <laughs> I kind of want every single strategy to be viable. And I know that actually many game designers don't do that. For example, with Agricola, I might be wrong. I haven't played it enough, but I don't think you can afford to not feed your family. I think you have to feed your family. You can't, you can't take all those negative points. See, I want to play a game when I can play a strategy without feeding my family. (laughs) That sounds horrible. (laughs) But I, I, there has to be a risk to that, but I want to be able to do that. And so that's how we look at things like the virtue track in, in Architects where it says, hey, hey, don't go down here too far. It's trouble, but you can actually come out of it. So yeah, I, I think it starts for me with a lot of obsessing and then we hit the spreadsheets and then we play and play and play. And and when I play test, I don't just try and win. I, it's like, I heard someone say this analogy. It's like, when you're going to look at a house, if you're looking to buy the house, you walk up to all the walls and all the, and all the doors and you're, you're checking everything out to, to really find details. If you're going to a friend's house, you'll just have a look around and say, this is a nice house. <laughs> so when we play test, we want to, you know, try everything out, things that shouldn't work, things that might work, things that other people would think of that you might not normally think of. And we just test those. And then, after the game, we'll, we'll be like, did I deserve to win? I won that game, but did I deserve to win? Or I thought I should have scored higher than what I did because I felt like I played well. And then we'll tweak um, the games based on that as well, based on feel. Very cool. And so, Shim, tell me your side of things, especially with the spreadsheets and, and you know figuring out how much things are worth. Tell me about vic- uh, victory points. Yeah, I mean, what Sam said there at the very end was like exactly how we do test. We, we get to the end of our games and we go, do I feel like I did well? Do I feel like I deserve to win? Um, and that's actually a really good thing to ask yourself when you're testing games, I think. Because um, often you might get to a game and go, I feel like I should have won that. Everyone felt at the table that I was winning, you know, and why didn't I? Um, or you get to the game, in the game and you go, oh, I won, really? I felt like I was doing really bad. And so that's a good thing to dive into. Um, the other side, that the spreadsheets, I don't know. I feel like that's the easy part. And unless it's a game like Architects where there's this like dynamic scale of numbers, just figuring out what things are worth is quite easy. And if you don't know how, basically find something that you already have a point assigned to in a game. Like I was saying in, in, in uh, Raiders, one gold is worth a point. So you've got this plumb line and then base everything around off that. So if you, like in, Archite- in Raiders, sorry, if you have an action that says discard two cards to get a gold, which you know is a point, then you now know that a card is half a point. So there's really easy ways to figure out around that. I mean, there are, yeah, there are games that are harder to figure out, but if it's a simple kind of resource conversion style game, then that's a really simple way of doing it. Gotcha. And now, Shim, what are your thoughts as far as open scoring versus closed 
scoring. You know, some games you can look around the table and you know exactly how many points people have. You might do a little math in your head, but you can still figure out, okay, I'm 10 points down. Whereas other games, a lot of it's closed. You're like, okay, I think I'm winning or I might be losing. You're not entirely sure until the end game scoring. Tell me your thoughts as far as open versus closed. Yeah, so personally, I prefer right in the middle um, or more towards mainly close, mainly open. Sorry. Um, so Dominion is what I would say is almost 100% closed, which I can't stand because you get to the end of the game and go, all right, who won? Oh, you did. Oh, well done. Like no one really knew who was winning. There's no track. There's no way of knowing. Um, whereas other games where it's all public information, you suddenly realize in the last round, oh, I can't win. There's no way I can win. I know everything that's available. Why do we bother with the last round? And that's just not fun. So I think you need a bit of both to make a game really work. All right. So Sam, let's keep talking about victory points. Let's talk about end game as far as like how the game uh, ending gets triggered. How do you how do you figure that out? What makes sense based on the different theme, different game, uh, all those kinds of things. What, what are you thinking about when you're designing a game as far as like how is this game going to end? I mean, you could do a certain number of rounds. You could do a, you know, it's almost like a race to get to a certain end game trigger, whatever. Tell me your your process. Yeah, so we actually often start uh, when we design. We don't design the end game straight away. We'll just be testing this game and we'll just go an arbitrary number of rounds or however it works and decide, okay, we've, we've, we know enough now. And so it's something that we do a little bit later on in the piece. My preference is that the, the, um, the game time can vary. And that, like a game like Scythe, for example, that, that can vary because what I like is for players to adapt to how others are playing. So then they can't calculate in round one, two, and three, I always do this. Rounds four, five, six, I must do this. And then round seven and eight, I always do this. It's a little bit more dynamic if you can make it like that. Um, and also the, the other benefit to not having rounds is that it generally will flow faster if you don't have a sort of a reset phase. So if the game is going to vary, then you kind of look at what are some of the big actions that players do, and we'll have a set number of those actions. So in Raiders, I know I didn't design it, but in Raiders, it makes sense that the game is going to end either by number of raids, um, I think it's on the fortresses, or number of offering tiles that have been taken. Um, those are the kind of the big point scoring actions. So we'll give players a certain number of those, and then we'll end the game after that, that many. So that allows players to actually go out for it and to rush and to apply pressure on others. But they can also take it slow, and they can start, kind of handshake on it a little bit. Oh, you're not going to build a building in Architects in the Guildhall? I won't build a building either. And we'll both just slowly gather up our resources. Um, and then there'll be a bit of a mad rush towards the end and a, a, a tension there. And, um, um, and wanting to kind of maximize your last few actions. Yeah, gotcha. Shim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's that's exactly it. Um, I do know that with Architects, like Sam said, we didn't actually have the end game planned. Um, there was nothing that we designed early on. So that was like, well, how do we finish this game? Um, when you've played games like San Juan or Citadels, it's always about having a certain number of buildings in your tableau. Um, and so we kind of like that idea in, in architects, though, there is there's like building cards, but then there's a public cathedral that you can all contribute to if you want to. So we thought, well, we can't have like a game where uh, once someone gets to the top of the cathedral, the game ends because no one might do that. So we ended up creating this guild hall area in the game where every time you do either a building or a cathedral action, you place a worker. And then we're like, well, there's our timer. It's a certain number of workers placed in the guild hall. Yeah, I've got one more thing to add also about um, Endgame is that you kind of want it to be that players can do almost, almost everything that they wanted to do. And maybe, maybe about 5% of the time they actually can do everything that they wanted to do so that it's kind of, it's possible, but it's just out of reach. And so then they say, okay, I'm going to try that strategy again. And if I just do this little action earlier then i might be able to get everything done that i wanted to um by the time the game ends it's all about tension eh? yeah 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 I've, I've heard other designers talk about how they want their game to end right before the people at the table want it to end right? yeah and exactly. so it doesn't overstay its welcome and then it also a lot of times leads people into wanting to play it play it again they want to say okay what if i do this strategy a little bit differently or, or change it up because they weren't able to kind of fully complete it the way they wanted to yeah. Now, you've mentioned playtesting uh, a little bit. Let's go a little bit deeper into your specific playtesting. 
uh, process. Shim, what are some of the things you're looking for? How do you know that one of these games is really working the way that you want it to? What, do, what are you writing down in your notes as you're watching playtesters, that kind of thing? So we're, it's funny. I think it's part of being in New Zealand. Sam and I are quite different, I think, to a lot of other sort of, uh, what do you say, like the, the norm, I guess. So a lot of our testing is actually just us. Um, so just two of us in a room playing our game over and over again, making small tweaks. Um, we won't even show it to people for, for months, probably. Um, so that's, I know that's very different than what most people tell you. It just depends on your situation, I suppose. If you've got access to a lot of people, which no one does currently, um, then you can you can quite easily like play the game on a weekly basis with different people, and that's that's great. One one thing that I do find about that though is that you're going to get a lot of strange, weird, wonderful suggestions, which can be good, but it can be hard to filter. Uh, whereas for us, um, I think when it's just us, we can bounce back quite fast ideas and spitball stuff quite quickly, and make changes a lot faster. Um, I think a lot of that, though, um, is a little bit of, it sounds arrogant, so I'll just say it, but um, it's kind of like a maturity as a designer. So you start to really, it's not just that, it's confidence as well, but knowing that you are capable of making a good game. Um, and it's hard for like the first five or 10 years as a designer, you're always questioning yourself if I, if you should be doing this or not. But eventually it does get easier and you start to really trust your own gut quite a bit. Um, so we do a lot of internal testing. Um and then once we're ready, once we feel like we need more players, then we'll expand it out and then um, we'll do a lot more public testing. But to be honest, we actually don't do that much public testing. Um, we show it to a lot of designers that we know locally and then we'll just have our own kind of bubbles of friends that will play the game. Um, yeah, so we're a little bit different, to be honest. Sam, do you have anything to add as far as your thoughts on playtesting? I just I totally agree with Shem. That's just what works for us. It might not work for some of you listeners, but it works for us that we kind of obsess over it. And I, I'm thinking about our games all the time. I think it helps to really, really try, and this is hard to do as a human, but to not be biased, to almost take off your own lenses and say, if this was someone else's game, would I like it? Is this a good game? If this was anyone's design, not my design, if this was anyone's design, would I like it? And if you can be honest with yourself and say, no, nah, this is actually bad, it's not that good, or yeah, this has got potential, that, that'll that help you a lot if you can do that. And then you start to kind of figure out what's missing, what do I need to fix, what doesn't need to be there, um, and just be really critical kind of with your own designs. Um, then you don't need other people to be as critical because you're the first person to do that. Yeah. Now let's talk player count real quick. So some of your games go two to four, some one to four, some one to five. So Shim, tell me about, you know, figuring out the the best player count. Tell me about solo modes, you know, trying to make your game accessible for just one player. Tell me about that. I think if I could for like, at least for this like medieval kind of setting of games, I would probably make them all one to four. Um, simply because now that we've been in a while, we realize that solo is really important, but also great for testing purposes. But um with with a four max, then you can easily do like a, a five player expansion if you want to down the line, and it keeps the game length often at a at a shorter period for four players. Whereas like like shipwrights back then, I was like, yeah, let's make it five players. But now looking back, I go, well, that's a really long game. So it kind of it can ruin some people's experiences if they play at the full player count when it shouldn't really be at the full player count. Um, but uh, I was going to say. Um, with Architects, that was a, a bit of a rare one because we actually felt the game shined at five and six players. So that was like, well, I don't want to do six players in the box because that's going to make the game really expensive and not, probably not fit too well in the box. Um, so we kept it at five with the hope that we'd be able to do a six-player expansion at some point. Um, but that's just, a, for any game, you kind of figure out what is the, the ideal player count. Um, can you make it solo? If you can, you should probably do it if you've got the time and the energy to do it. But then that, that high limit, I think a lot of that comes in from a publishing point of view. Like what is the price point of the game? What is the, the market of the, you know, the what is the target for the game? But also um, it comes down to that player experience. So, I mean, an example is say Citadels that plays, I think it's three to seven in the box. I think eight with the expansion. That game varies heavily on player count. So you're going to get a very different experience to different player counts. And I think, I don't know, I think in today's market, you've got to be a bit wary of that. You want to give a very similar um, 
I guess, experience at different player counts, very similar across all player counts, whereas back in the day, it probably wasn't much of an issue as much. Um, but that's just something to be aware of as, as a designer is go, what, where does this game shine? Um, and then, and then like, yeah, highlight on that, I suppose. So we, we probably could have almost capped architects at like a three to five if we wanted to, but we knew that we could implement a good solo mode. So we went right down to solo for that one. Yeah, and tell me more about creating a solo mode for a worker placement game. Because I feel like it's going to be a little bit different than you know an action game, an adventure game, or something else. Uh, Sam, that's probably more you. <laughs> yeah, um, we love we love designing solo modes. It's super fun, and this actually ties back into the testing question as well. I'll just add this first: is that we design a solo mode now quite early on in the piece. And that allows us to do a lot of testing and a lot of different strategies as well. So for Viscounts, what we did is we designed four different AIs um, and each of them did a kind of a different strategy in the game. And we got to see if they were balanced when playing them against each other. So that was helpful. But if you're wanting to design a solo mode in your game, first off, you need to ask this question, where are the points of interaction in the game? So write down a little list. So start off with maybe blocking with workers. Start off with, um, you know, if there's cards, drafting those cards. Uh, always There's always going to be victory points as well. That's a point of interaction. Can you win? Can you lose? That sort of thing. And so you want to write down all of those points. And if possible, your AI needs to be able to do all of those things and do them cleverly. Do them like how a human would do them so that the, the AI can really get in your way, that they can feel like a player that is blocking you, that is taking the actions that you're wanting to do. So you write those down first. Uh, with with worker placement, it's actually easier than, than some games because you can create a little uh, deck of cards. We call them scheme cards. And those cards can tell you where the AI is going to place their worker or where they're going to block or those sorts of things. And then the other thing I like to do is to let the AI ramp up over time because normally human players will ramp up. They'll get stronger and stronger over time. So the AI usually will need a way of doing that. And so we kind of often will make it deck build. So it's got another uh, deck of cards that are better. And over time, it's adding those into its uh, deck of scheme cards to get stronger and stronger. Definitely. Well, gentlemen, this has been awesome. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts, Shim? Anything that you want to leave listeners with as far as designing worker placement games? You know, especially if someone they're sitting there, they're listening to this, they're thinking, "Gosh, I want to design one of these," or maybe I've been working on one, I'm stuck. You know, what would you tell somebody kind of as a, as a closing thought? I think just try something fresh. Like I'm, I often, if I get stuck with stuff, I'll just grab out a bunch of components on my desk and just look at them and just move them around and just kind of think, just stare at them for like an hour or something. And just think, how could I use these differently? And um, I think it's just trying to find those sparks. So I think just, yeah, just try and think, look, look at games you like, ones that do things differently and go, okay, they did that differently. Uh, can I do something like that? Can I do something different? Uh, and just really try and find that, that freshness in the mechanism rather than just trying to do what someone else has already done. Try and find something new and unique. Yeah, you and I are, are very similar in our design process. I feel like half of my design time is just staring at stuff sitting on the table, not moving, <laughs> maybe not even blinking, barely breathing. Yeah. You know, my wife has walked in. She's like, hey, hey, she snap her fingers. You know, hey, do you have a stroke? Are you okay? Like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm figuring out something. <laughs> Leave me alone, you know. And so I'm a big fan of just staring at stuff until the, the idea comes out. Sam, what about you? You got any closing thoughts? I love talking to people. So I've got Shem and I've got another friend where I'll just talk about ideas like would this work would would there be a game where you use dice that that um the number means you go a different direction on a hexagon say i use that in circadians and just talk it through because the the person might then say oh yeah yeah but what if you did this and you can kind of bounce off each other so i find that really really helpful if you've got fellow nerds that love to just talk mechanisms you know talk novel kind of ideas because the combination of ideas will make something unique i think because it can be quite hard just going at it alone so yeah find some fellow nerds that love talking game design with you and and you can do it online you can do it on messenger if you're stuck at home that's like it's like two months of our development okay sam like before we even play a game we spend about two months just spitballing ideas yeah awesome well sham you got a game on kickstarter right now it's actually from a different company than your own uh, publishing company and so tell me a little bit about that one yeah so shelfie stacker is a little dice abstract game that i created 
um, which I knew didn't really fit the Garfield Games brand. So I had some, it's quite funny, I had these friends, I had pitched the game to a couple of publishers uh, with no luck, with different theme and different kind of things going on. And then I had these friends that are creating this new publishing company who are all, well, one of them still at Weta Workshop, one's ex Weta Workshop. Um, and I thought, hey, hang on, I've got this game that might actually fit your brand quite well because they want to do fairly um, easy access kind of games with really incredible artwork um, and, and fun themes. So I took this game to them. They really enjoyed it. They played around a lot with the theme. Um, and they ended up turning this game, this game where it's basically about trying to fit your board games onto your shelf. Um, so it's a really fun meta kind of game. But it's it's uh, the game itself is like a, a seven round game where you play cards to determine turn order. They give you powers for the game and you're trying to fit these dice with different pips into the, your shelf with certain uh, rules around colors and numbers and that kind of stuff. So it's a really fun, crunchy little game. Very cool. And like I said, it's on Kickstarter right now. Well, gentlemen, really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, good luck with all the, the, the more worker placement games I know you have uh, in the works <laughs> and everything else you got going on right now. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. It's been a privilege. 